Today is our it is our great pleasure to introduce um, our presentation team of of esteemed HTP activists. First of all, Yanni Chung is a professor in the Department of Organizational Performance and Workplace Learning at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. She teaches courses on program evaluation and quantitative research in organizations. Other presenters include two teams of students and graduates of the OPWL master's degree program. Uh, and these are from different locations, as, as you can see on the map. Each team recently completed a program evaluation for their client. One team was led by uh, Mark Morgan. Mark is an instructional designer at VSP Global in California. Unfortunately, his two teammates could not be with us today. Another team was led by Tammy Wheeler. Tammy is a technical coordinator with the Department of Revenue Cycle Training at Virginia Commonwealth University Health in Richmond, Virginia. Her teammate, Ji Chen, lives in California and recently completed her master's degree. She, she has six years experience in learning and development and human resource management. Another teammate, Teresa Britton, is a senior continuous improvement coach for St. Luke's Health System in Idaho. They will present their evaluation case studies as part of today's webinar. I would like to now hand it over to Yanni Chung to begin the presentation. Good, welcome. Welcome to our webinar, everyone. So we're going to talk about uh, conducting evaluations with a 10-step procedure today. Um, you may or may have not um, heard of this 10-step evaluation procedure, but if you took an evaluation class from Boise State University, probably you have uh, actually used it to do your evaluation project. So our webinar, webinar is going to have an overview and two case studies of evaluations that were conducted just last year. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of what this 10-step evaluation procedure is all about. And um, shortly in the chat box, uh, Gia is going to post a URL of this handout uh, where you can go there and then download just a two-page handout where <clears throat> You can see a, a figure and a table explaining this 10-step evaluation procedure. So you can uh, use that as a reference in the future. So during the presentation, I want to just warn you that um, we will use some jargon that the professionals use. Uh, one of them is like evaluant. I didn't know about this term uh, before I started working on program evaluation. And this is term, uh, this term is um, uh, Michael Scriven uh, coined this term, and it, it means the thing that you're evaluating. So it's the evaluant. And also, we're going to talk about formal evaluation and summary evaluation, and also something called program logic model, too, and training logic uh, impact model. So we're going to uh, talk about those things. And then after the overview, we'll present two evaluation projects that two evaluation teams completed at two different organizations last year as their master degree class project. So assuming that most of you are working in industry, and what are the common things that you to offer to your, your employees and you have to evaluate? You know, think about it for a second. Um, I bet um, you have uh, onboarding process in your organization. Also, many organizations have uh, e-learning programs. So you have to evaluate one of these things um, in your workplace. And that's what our two teams did too. One team evaluated uh, hiring and onboarding process uh, in a call center. And then another team evaluated a, um, a refresher e-training program at a healthcare organization. And that's what we're going to, or they're going to talk about today, too. So let's get started with the overview. So what is this 10-step evaluation procedure? First, 
let's start with the Kirkpatrick's eva uh, evaluation framework. And who is not familiar with this? I mean, that's kind of a silly question because I assume most, if not all, at least heard of this framework, right? So this is really popular, at least in the training and development uh, field. The first level is to uh, investigate the participant's reaction, how much they liked or didn't like. And second one is how much they learn from the training uh, program. Third, now are they using the skills when they went back to the job? The last one, um, did the training program contribute to the organizational goals? So these are four levels that trainers and training professionals can use when they evaluate training programs. It's really popular, but you probably you recognize some uh, strengths and weaknesses too. So uh, I'm going to give you a quick question. So imagine this. This morning, and you are a, a performance improvement specialist in your organization, and then someone from your organization came to your office this morning and said, hey, um, you know, we deliver the safety training program to all technicians every year, and it's mandatory. But I think we've got to evaluate this, how good it is, don't you think? So uh, would you evaluate this program for us? So you've been asked to evaluate this training program, and what is the first thing that you will do? I'm going to give you some options to choose from. First, you will develop survey or in interview questions that you're going to use. Okay. How about second? You're going to decide whether you're going to evaluate the participant's satisfaction, their learning outcomes, or behavioral change. Third, tell them that you know you don't have to evaluate this because it's a mandatory training program, so you don't really need to do that. Or last, you're going to do something else than what I propose to you here. So in the check box, would you go ahead and write one, two, three, or four of your choice that you think you're going to do? So we see what your thoughts are. Okay, I start seeing numbers. Um, four, four, four. Okay, it's dominant answer. <laughs> that's really great, actually, because that's what I was hoping to hear. That's the answer. Um, so with this somewhat silly question, the um, reason I'm asking is that I'm trying to make the point that when we uh, evaluate something, anything, training or non-training program, it's easy for us to just jump in and see, oh, I'm, uh, we have this data, so I'm going to just jump in and start analyzing this data. Or I'm going to start developing a survey. Should I use survey or interview? Before we lay out some planning for the evaluation project. So that's something that we should not be doing. So let's see what's missing here. Again, take a look at the handout later. Uh, the screen might not show uh, the fine print here, but there are two other phases before the implementation phase. The first one is identification phase, and the second one in the middle is planning phase. So all together, I laid out a 10-step procedure for evaluation that came out of my um, many years of my teaching and practicing in program evaluation. And um, you will be able to find more information about this 10-step evaluation procedure from, my, from the book that will be published by SAGE sometime this year. And, um, but I have to tell you this, though. I did not come up with this 10-step procedure out of nowhere overnight. Um, over the last 25 years or so of my career conducting research and evaluation, I realized that there are so many things that I have to consider when I conduct evaluations and other types of research. And I need to do that, and I need to do that. So I started collecting all these important elements. That, um, so there are so many, but there isn't really a good source out there that teaches me or you how to put these elements in a, some sort of a logical uh, you know, procedure. So like a recipe, you need to have some sort of recipe to follow. That will make things easy. 
So I started to print all of these elements in logical order like this. So I need to put it here, up front, or middle, or to the end. But here I must give credit to uh, the evaluation group, Michael Scriven, and his key evaluation checklist. Because while I was doing this, I, I used his key evaluation checklist a lot. His checklist is not like this, but it was very helpful. So that's how I got this 10-step evaluation procedure. And this works for evaluating any type of programs, training programs or non-training programs. So uh, uh, let me uh, give you some explanation about each phase before I do that. Um, let me ask you, uh, are you, uh, any, of, uh, any of you are an instructional designer or even though you are not an instructional designer by job title, have you done any instructional design? It, you can go ahead and say yes or no in the checkbox. Yes, Mike. And so I bet some of you are uh, instructional designers for sure. Yes, professor of instructional design. Hi, uh, Suzanne, Mark, yes. So I bet many of you are. The reason I'm asking you is because when you're an instructional designer, you will know this. Voila, this is the Dick and Carey's instructional design procedure. It's really popular. I don't know if these days people are using this or not, but this was like a, when I was studying back in the day, uh, it was like a Bible at the time. Um, but when, I, when you look at this uh, um, procedure, you can also see the ADDI model, right? A-D-D-I-E. You analyze the content up front. You design and develop the content. You implement the content and then evaluate at the end. So that is NADI model. Now, put that ADDI concept into the evaluation procedure now. So here are 10 steps, and we can apply the ADDI steps into these 10 steps too. I didn't really think of ADDI when I was doing this, but now I realized, oh, this is ADDI too. So you can see that you have to analyze what you're going to analyze, I mean, what you're going to evaluate. And you have to analyze not the learners now, but you, the stakeholders of the program. And you have to analyze the purpose of doing the evaluation. That's the analysis phase. And then you have to design and develop the instruments to use, survey or interview or whatever. Then you have to implement the, uh, um, the data collection methods. Now, the next question is, now the ADA model says last step is E, evaluation. But this is an evaluation project, so should you do an evaluation on top of evaluation? What do you think? So that is kind of, hmm, should I or should I not? Where does evaluation go? Um, yes, somebody say yes, uh, Michael. I agree. So it's called a meta-evaluation, actually, because it's an evaluation of evaluation, so it's called meta-evaluation. And in fact, you have to um, do the uh, formative meta-evaluation throughout the steps, and then you will do summative meta-evaluation at the end. So let's see um, what goes into each phase here. So during the identification phase, you identify the evaluant and then the stakeholders. Now, why should you even care about stakeholders so early? The reason is because there are three types of stakeholders. The one type is the upstream stakeholders. Um, they are the one who designed, developed, and maintained or maintaining the program right now. And the second type is direct impactees. They are the actual participants of the program. And there are also indirect impactees who are impacted by the actual participants of the program. So employees of the participants, you know, things like that. So the reason we have to analyze these types of stakeholders up front is because later on, pretty soon, you are going to contact them to gather data. It's all about evidence-based practice, right? I mean, evaluation cannot be done without evidence. So evidence comes from them. Um, of course, there are some other evidence that are existing out there, like records and documents, but these people are the ones who know about the program, and you have to go back and get the data from them. So it's important to gather data 
um, and analyze who they are up front. Now, another reason is because in order for you to be able to conduct and plan this evaluation project, you have to know what type of evaluation you're going to conduct. Um, in order to do that, you have to ask the stakeholders, what do you want from this evaluation project? Uh, I cannot just make up plans for you. So what do you want to get out of this program and evaluation? Now, if they tell you that, oh, I want the evaluation findings to help me change things so I can improve the program, then it's going to be a formal evaluation. But if they tell you that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pr propose to the funding, you know, like a grant proposal, and I need this evaluation done so that I can use the findings to write up my funding uh, proposal, or I want to change, I'm thinking of whether I should uh, continue or discontinue this program. So I want you to tell me what should I do. That kind of uh, intention will be a, what, summary evaluation. So you have to know the stakeholders, and then based on their input, you will be able to um, plan your evaluation. But the thing in here is that when you go actually go to your client site, and sit with them, like a client and other stakeholders. First, you talk with the client first, and then they don't always tell you what they want, or they don't even, sometimes they don't know. I mean, certainly they don't use the jargon like a formal evaluation, summary evaluation, um, and you have to ask questions to gather information, and you have to help them decide what they need to do. So that takes some, some consulting skills of yours, right? So um, what I'm going to do, or what we're going to do now is that we're going to give you some quick role play, okay, it's just for fun. Now, here it comes. Please welcome the client, Ms. Jia Chan, and here is the evaluator, Ms. Teresa Britton. How about this? Um, I'll do the GIA, okay? Because the echo is kind of uh, not, not really uh, easy to hear. So let's do that. All right, so let me start again. Welcome uh, here, the client, uh, Yanni, and the evaluator, uh, Teresa Britton. Okay? Okay, so this leadership training program, when did you start offering the program? Well, we recently started this program just last year, um, and we ran this program maybe twice so far. Have you collected any data? Oh, yeah. Uh, we conducted this exit survey at the end of the program, but we never really had a time to analyze the data. So can you just use this data in your evaluation? That's great that you conducted an exit survey. The survey data will be useful. What questions did you include in the survey? Oh, um, he, here is a survey I can show you. Okay, um, the exit survey, um, we were really interested in hearing about what the participants had to say about the program, if they value the program activities, or, you know, if they found them interesting, um, or if they will attend it again, you know, all those things. So we wanted to make sure that we get the most out of the uh, program, or they get most out of the program. So we just scan through the survey data, and we have uh, some anecdotal data, too. Have you taken any actions after you re reviewed the survey data, or based on the anecdotal data? Oh, well, we hear some participants saying that they like the hands-on activities, so we added some hands-on activities, yes. And some other people say one of the activities was too long. Well, we didn't think so, but they said that, so we, we shouldn't a little bit, yeah. So you have made changes to the program based on their input. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to make more changes to the program if the evaluation indicates areas of improvement? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that we are providing really good quality program to the participants, for sure. And we are open to making some changes. Um, as we make those changes to the program, it may look quite different from the, the one that, that we have now, but that's okay. Do you intend to use the evaluation results to make administrative or financial decisions, like deciding whether to continue or discontinue the program? Or is there any chance that the evaluation results would influence if or how the program is funded? Well, we'll continue the, the program. I mean, we're not thinking of discontinuing anytime soon. 
I don't know until when, but probably for a long time we're going to run this program. And currently the program is funded, you know, it, it's a self-funded program. And um, the evaluation results will, will not impact our decision to continue and self-fund the program. And we are seeking external funding sources too, but that's a separate issue. But this, that's not going to affect this uh, evaluation at all. I see. Based on what you're, you've said so far, it looks like the main reason you want to have this evaluation conducted is because you want to see if any areas of the program need to be changed to provide a good quality program to the participants. Is that right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want me to include such information in the final report? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me ask you this. Other than you, who will read the final report and why? Other than me, um, I work closer with the three other step members here. I think I will share the final report with them because they also need to know what needs to be changed. I'm not the only one who does this, so um, they have to agree with the changes too. So their input is really important. And so we all work together to develop this program, but they are, they are the ones who, who are running the program activities. So yeah, I'll share with them. Sounds good. Anybody else from the management level? Oh, no. Um, I don't think they'll need to see this report. It's up to us how we're going to run this program. They're not really um, getting into this detail. So I'll just talk to them in the meeting, but I'm not going to share the you know, report or anything. OK, I understand. May I also talk to the three staff members? Oh, yeah. Um, their offices are right there uh, down the hall. Good. I'd like to go see them after our meeting. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. So that is our short uh, scenario. Actually, this is based on the real um, conversation between um, the evaluator. Actually, that was me um, going into a client and then um, just brief talk. But I revised it a little bit to make it fit here. So uh, like you saw or heard in the scenario, uh, it is the evaluator's role to ask the right question and to find out what the client wants and needs and what type of evaluation this, uh, this client is needing to get out of your project. And um, you as a professional know the jargon, formative evaluation, summative evaluation, or, you know, evaluant, but probably it's, it, you're not going to use those, jar, you know, jargon at all. Um, and they may not know that. So without using any jargon, you have to explain things um, and then retrieve the information that you need. So um, after you complete the first couple of steps and you're moving into the planning phase. So one of the first steps in the planning phase is to develop a program logic model. Now, uh, Boise State University people will know about program logic model and I'm, I'm hoping that other people will be uh, familiar with the program logic model as well. If you're not, this is a really cool thing that you should, you should really um, learn to use how to, how to develop program logic model. Now, there are several ways to develop a program logic model, and one of them is um, the Kellogg, the serial, you know, company Kellogg. Kellogg Foundation is one of the leading uh, organizations, and it, they put out the guidelines out there, and other people have adopted their guidelines. So, according to their guidelines, and you will have five categories like this, resources, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact. And the logic behind this is the if-then logic. If you use these resources and activities, then you will get these end results. That's very simple if-then uh, logic. For example, I was looking for a, a program um, to use a sample a while ago, and I found this really cool website. It's called Bit the Micro. Bead. This is a URL you can go out and look. And this is a copy of their website <coughs> um, graphic. So apparently um, several, many uh, companies are using microbead in the products such as cosmetics and um, soap and uh, uh, even toothpaste. And it's going to come back to hormones. So it is environmental, uh, you know, contamination. So just imagine, yeah, let's use this as a uh, sample, and this is a program that you are going to develop. You know, just imagine that. 
then uh, program event, uh, I'm sorry, program logic model is supposed to be developed in the beginning of the program development. So imagine that you're developing this app. So apply this if-then logic, then what it looks like, so I made this up, if you're using volunteers, researchers, app developers, and website developers, and so on, then, and if you're doing these activities, developing the app, developing the uh, website, and announcing the app via social media, then you will actually develop and have the app out there, website out there running, and social media announcements that you're producing, then outcomes. The public is going to be aware of the problems associated with the microbits, and they're going to start using the app and avoid purchasing the products that contain microbits. Then impact. Other companies hopefully stop using microbits in their products and less pollution in our water source. So you can see that this very simple if-then logic behind this, right? So program logic model is not the only way to do it. There's a training impact model. Uh, Robert Brinkerhoff developed this in his success case method. He uses different categories. Uh, program capabilities uh, are basically learning outcomes. And this example is about the uh, volunteer, uh, animal shelter volunteer training program. So program capabilities are about, okay, what are they going to learn from the pro program? Critical actions, basically behavioral changes, what are they going to be able to do? Key results and business goals are two layers of, I mean, organizational results. So either you can use a program logic model or training impact model if your program is a training program. But why, sh what, why do we need to use training or program logic model? A cool thing about it is that when you have a program logic model, it really helps you and your client to see what elements you need to investigate during your evaluation project. So it's called dimensions. What dimensions would you investigate among these elements that you just laid out? So it's really handy. If you don't have a program logic model, you can still design your you know, evaluation plan, but it's going to be harder, much harder, because you don't have this kind of visual representation in front of you. And also, it really helps you know um, the, I mean, select the appropriate dimensions. So if you're conducting a formal evaluation, then your dimensions would likely come from more means here, resources, activities, and outputs, versus if you're conducting a summary evaluations, then your dimensions will come more from outputs, outcomes, and impact. So it really helps in that way too. Sometimes your dimensions may look just like four levels of Kirkpatrick's framework, satisfaction, learning outcomes, and behavioral change, and revenue increase. That's okay, but um, those dimensions are preset dimensions, right? So it's really convenient sometimes, but in other cases, it's not so good because your program is not a training program, then these dimensions don't always work for you. And the framework itself does not really tell you exactly um, what to evaluate. Um, so, again, you can go back to your program logic model and pick out exactly what dimensions to evaluate. That's a good thing about having a program logic model right there. Now, after you uh, have a dimension selected, then you design your I mean, I mean, determine, design your uh, data collection methods. And then um, that's where you select whether you should use survey, interview, um, focus group, and so on. And then you propose to your client. And if they say yes, and you develop, collect data, analyze data, draw conclusions, and produce the final report, and then send it to your client. So that's the gist of the 10-step evaluation procedure. So now uh, Mark and Tammy will talk about their evaluation projects that they use this 
step-step procedure and then tell us really, really interesting stories about what happened during their projects. Okay, Mark? Thank you, Yanni. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through uh, the first case, which was done with me and two other students uh, with a company called Nations Vision Insurance, or NVI. Uh, in their call center around their hiring and onboarding process. NVI is a pseudonym, um, but it was a real organization that we happen to work with. So I'm going to give you a little background about our project and then really dive in and talk about a couple different sections. Um, first of all, I want to look at that program logic model and what worked in getting that built uh, in our particular project. And then I want to look quickly at the gathering of extant data um, when we got to that point and what wasn't expected um, and how we worked through that uh, and maybe even what could have gone better. So a little background, uh, Nations Vision Insurance is a national vision insurance company uh, with optometrists throughout the United States. We employ, they employ about 500 customer service representatives across two call centers, one in California and one out in Ohio. Uh, to account for growth and revenue, the customer service department hires about 100 CSRs a year. Um, historically, the hiring decisions themselves have been made by uh, the customer service supervisors after interviewing, and there has been limited input from human resources. During uh, 2014 and 2015, the hiring strategy included a partnership with a temporary agency where a contract to hire strategy was implemented. About midway through 2015, NVI eliminated the use of that temporary agency, and by 2016, they were hiring directly uh, in, to NVI, and they were full NVI um, employees. So the project team consisted of two Boise State students who were external to NVI, and we also had an internal uh, student as well. So someone who worked at NVI was with us, and that created um, some interesting challenges as well. Our main upstream stakeholder and the person who we interacted with most uh, was named Andy, and he is a call center manager who was in charge of the hiring. So I want to focus in on the project program logic model a little bit uh, because we did create that towards the beginning and it focused on the business output and outcomes. Again, these are the categories uh, of the PLM and the trick was creating the right questions to ask of Andy in order to fill in these elements. Um, and what we found was the way that we asked these questions really helped us in completing uh, the PLM. So let me ask you real quickly, do you have, is there a go-to question that you use during analysis when you're meeting with sponsors, stakeholders, the people who say, hey, we want you to do this product uh, or this project to help find out what that is? And if you'll just use chat and let us know, is there a go-to question you ask when trying to figure out what the outcomes are? Okay, I'm not seeing any come through, so think about that, though, uh, because that's what we had to design. Okay, because, so here's what we ended up coming up with. Good, so there was one that popped up about what was the purpose of your program. Yes, and that certainly is one. Here's what we ended up coming up with on the outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Uh, but how we got there was that we didn't come out and say what are the outcomes. Uh, we had to ask questions the right way, right? And by doing that, here were some questions that we asked. Again, we were uh, coming in after the case, so we asked why was the program even implemented. We also were able to ask what will tell us, tell you it's working. What we found is that if we focused Andy and asked questions like this, he would actually give us the outcomes. And so what we had to do then was we asked him those questions, got those stories from him. Rather than making him do all the work, we went offline and then filled in the outputs, outcomes, and impacts. Uh, um, with him rather than asking a direct question of what were the outcomes of the program as we go. We did the same thing on the rest of the program logic model for resources and activities, uh, but the same thing. Rather than making him say what are, rather than asking what are the resources, we asked, you know, who was involved? What is being done? 
And so what we found is that it's easier to get your sponsor to tell their stories uh, and give you the information in that way and then take it offline to fill in the project logic program logic model rather than um, asking them directly to fill it in for you. You don't make them do the work. Just a quick side note about the program logic model um, that I have found as I've used the tool once I've learned it. It works really well when you have well-established product projects like this one was or um, just when the project's farther along and at least you have some ideas. It is not a good tool to use in those initial meetings when someone had a spark in the middle of the night and says, hey Mark, I'd like you to try to create this program or I want you to do this. At that point, they don't even have enough information in their own mind uh, in order to complete the program logic model. So this is something to shelve at the beginning until you've at least had some meetings and started working out some details, and then you can circle back and bring this in. All right, so once we went through that with Andy, we came up with the dimensions that uh, we were going to um, really look at for him, uh, including did the streamlined process of the interviews and hiring directly work for them? Um, how were the candidates doing with the new program? Was there a difference? Uh, were they able to reduce turnover? And then in the Ohio area, was there even better brand awareness of NVI? So we ended up, even though it was after the program was implemented, really a formative uh, evaluation because the program was constantly changing. And what Andy really wanted to know, what Andy really wanted to know was, how can we continue to make it better um, rather than was it successful? Yes, there were some summative elements, but he really wanted to know how do we keep making it better. So now let's look at the data collection a little bit. We did three methods that we decided uh, that we were going to use to collect data. And the first one is we did surveys with the CSRs and the supervisors who supported them. And we ended up with a decent return rate on that, uh, about 32% on the supervisors, which isn't bad. And for the CSRs, we only had about a 10% sent response rate, but their survey was primarily focused on that brand awareness piece. Since that was the lowest um, in importance in what we were measuring, we decided to proceed, and we still were able to get a little bit good of good data there. Interviews, we ended up interviewing remotely um, because we had external participants, and uh, so that created some challenges to us, and uh, have any of you conducted interviews remotely? And uh, in chat, if you have, what have been some of the things that you have run into um, that were challenges with that? So some that we found as you're chatting, some, yeah, time zone certainly comes into play. Um, and again, we had Ohio, California, all sorts of things like that, right? Um, so what we found was that there were some um, issues. You do not, you do lose some of the body language. You do lose some of that face-to-face -face contact and knowing that the question wasn't understood. Uh, but one of the advantages we found was that you could record and go back and later listen to it um, through the platform. Okay. But what I really want to focus on here uh, in just a little bit before I turn it over to Tammy is that extant data review. And uh, this is where we ran into a bit of issues. Right, so the first issue we ran into was that um, the client wanted us to keep all the information confidential, and we thought that would be no problem, especially since we had an internal evaluator, but what we found was that was not necessarily the case. We had to scrub all the data, and it ended up taking hours and hours and hours uh, for our teammate who was internal to do that before we could even look at the data. Um, so, lesson learned was easy to say yes that we could do that, but realize that it's going to take a heck of a lot of time. Okay. The second thing really was is once we got that data, um, what we found was we had to make some decisions. For example, when we started building our rubric, um, because NVI hires throughout the year, we couldn't just go in and pull data from December and say how are things going. Uh, so we had to figure out what was that timeline. So for those hired in June, 
at what point would we come in and measure their absences and their attendance to see if they were on track uh, as opposed to those in October. So that took a few days to get through so that we could compare apples to apples on that. And then once we finally did get the data, um, it also took much longer than we thought to take the data and synthesize it for us. And so I actually was the one who ended up having to use Excel. And really that came down to the stats changed over time. Call centers have a ton of stats, but because the measurements themselves changed over time, I had to take data, and this is an example of the spreadsheet here, and figure out how to make things compare accurately so that we could meet it. And that took me a full weekend of number crunching and sweet talking to Excel. Um, so really the, the key thing around data that we found was it takes longer than you think, and you really have to plan for it um, as we go. But in the end, we did end up with a very good evaluation pro, um, report. Okay, and what we found was overall the program was doing pretty well, and we rated it as a fair. The one area that NVI continues to need to work on and have continued working on is their turnover um, as they go, and they are continuing that work as we speak. So we looked at the program logic model and some of the lessons we learned around data itself. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tammy, who's going to walk you through um, their project and some of their lessons learned. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. That was really great work. So similar to Mark's case study, our second example was conducted by three Boise State University graduate students uh, for UHealth, which we labeled as a pseudonym for this project. I'm going to go over a little bit of brief background about the project, what worked really well for us, and some challenges that we faced and how the team overcame those challenges. Our client, UHealth, it was founded as a medical college. Uh, the campus supports five different schools, including a cancer center and a children's hospital. So the, the focus of this particular project um, was on an online e-training program and it targeted uh, the patient access representatives. Um, so those are the folks that are taking co-payments throughout the medical college. And the overall goal of this refresher e-training program uh, was to enhance the representatives' abilities to perform their front desk payment posting tasks. So since this was a, a training program, the training impact model, or TIM, worked really well. Uh, for this particular project. It uh, presented how the e-training should be planned and what results should be produced. Uh, as we were filling in the TIM, it allowed the team to quickly understand the program in greater detail. And as the team became even more knowledgeable about the program, uh, we were able to add in desirable elements into the TIM. So we did have one internal uh, evaluator on the team. And um, our first challenge, despite the fact that we did have an internal evaluator, was actually convincing the client to move forward with the project. Uh, and the other challenge was getting more than one source of data to tell our story. First, I'll talk about how we convinced our, com our client to move forward with the project. So initially, I didn't get a lot of feedback when I suggested using the 10-step procedure to evaluate this online e-training. Anything new and different often makes people a little bit uncomfortable, and it takes a while to accept the change, right? Sometimes it's just easier to do it the old way and maybe just capture scores from an online knowledge test. So we discovered that change can take some time. Kind of like when credit cards got chips, we still swiped and, and swiped. And once we understood the why and the new expectation of it all, we began to accept the change a little bit better, and we began dipping our chips. So in our case, how did we get our client, you Health, to start dipping the chip? So I had showed up at the client's office quite a bit, and um, I explained the, that the current data that we had, so our test scores from this online training program, and then some of our financial batch reports alone, it wasn't enough uh, data to really determine how well this program was doing in order to improve it in the future. So the team needed to know more. We needed to know uh, what the training should need to use, what activities should happen, and what outcomes we should get consequently. The TIM was able to help us tremendously with this. Uh, we were able to plug in the information and uh, get a lot, a lot of information about this uh, training. So the client listened and agreed to move forward. Of course, the free graduate work, I'm, I'm sure, helped. 
the client was generally intrigued in the process and the level of detail that was involved. So the team would draft several areas or dimensions uh, based upon that training impact model and the stakeholders' needs. The client e easily agreed to areas of focus and she would rank each dimension accordingly. So the team would focus on e-training design, program implementation and support, and last but not least, the on-the-job performance. So our first hurdle was met. We convinced the client to move forward. Uh, now to collect as much data as possible so we can tell our story. So we uh, decided to push out a web survey to reach our patient access representatives. They were spread throughout uh, UHealth, so we figured that was the best way to reach them. We came back with a 14.5% response rate, uh, which actually was pretty good. And out of that 14.5%, we were asking them to enter, enter their name uh, for a follow-up interview. Some entered their name and some did not. Um, and out of those that did offer up a name, uh, a lot of them couldn't be reached for a follow-up phone interview. We got a lot of sorry out of office, and it appeared that quite a few staff members were on spring break during this time. So the team uh, didn't, didn't factor this into account, um, so we had some issues uh, conducting interviews. So, um, what would you do in our case? So you need to draw justified conclusions right away, uh, and your target audience was not available. Okay, would you first interview the manager in greater detail based upon your web findings? Second, would you interview an internal evaluator if you happen to have one on the team? Or third, would you skip interviews altogether and go on vacation too, or would you do something else? All right, so have a conversation with the client. <laughs> Teresa's going to go on vacation, it looks like. All right. Yep, interview the manager. Okay, great. Yep, that's exactly some of the answers I was looking to hear. The team actually did opt to interview the manager uh, and followed up with the team's internal evaluator to ensure what was being said on the web survey was indeed accurate enough for us to be able to draw conclusions. Okay, so here's one example of how we triangulated the data to draw a justified conclusion. So the web survey came back saying that 93.1% agree or strongly agree that the e-training was easy to navigate and complete. So what we did was we followed that information up with an interview with the team leader to help us understand the LMS and the e-training authoring tool that was used. Uh, from there, we would also look at a job aid that the staff used for LMS navigation. Uh, and then we looked at IT technical support tickets. And all this data to get together indicated that learners could locate and complete the e-training easily, mostly without any technical support, which was great. Um, so we also had some problems when collecting data using, uh, from staff using an e-learning design checklist to rate the quality of the program. So we had two out of six staff members that completed the checklist, uh, and the results looked a little rushed. It kind of looked like my son was rushing through his homework so he can get to soccer practice. So the team uh, needed to come up with another, another solution. We needed more thorough evaluation of the e-train design. Uh, so what we did is we turned to ourselves to run through the checklist. Uh, we gave open and honest input, and it was based upon our own knowledge of e-learning design. Uh, that we had learned at Boise State University. So both these sources together uh, turned out that the E-Train basically lived up to the best practices uh, that was derived from instructional design practices. So that was great. Uh, based upon this da data, we were able to go back to the, to the client and confidently say that, yes, the E-Train program was fairly well designed as it employed appropriate instructional strategies. So despite some challenges that the, teams, the team had, we uh, confidently rated the program as fair and concluded the project with evidence-based recommendations to improve the program for future use. We found that even strong existing internal relationships require persistence when trying a new way to evaluate a program. And we also learned that when formulating evalu dimensions, it's a good idea to move one step ahead by talking to staff early to describe any next steps and also to ensure availability is not an issue. 
This concludes our presentation. We thank you all for joining us. Um, looks like we have a couple minutes for some questions. If you have any questions that you want to shoot out in the chat box uh, to Yanni, Mark, or myself. Yeah, sorry, a question just came up that talked about uh, does an SME make uh, the POM easier? Absolutely, um, but again, I didn't necessarily ask them the specific language of the POM. We just asked the questions to make sure that we got the information we needed for the POM. I hope that helps. So did you use any particular software to manage your data, Tammy? Yes, uh, we used Excel to manage all of our data. Um, Gia did a great job of, we had, we had to scrub all of our data. Um, and she did a great job of pulling that all together. There was quite a bit of data that we had to sift through, um, and then we had to organize it in a way that made the most amount of sense. Okay, how about observation checklist? Can, can either of you answer that? We did not do any sort of observations, so we did not have um, a checklist like that. Yeah, we did not either. All right. Um, if anyone has uh, more questions, uh, you can send me and them um, uh, email. Uh, I'm going to post my uh, email address right here. So Tammy and uh, Mark can post their email addresses and you can direct them um, with your questions. And we'll love to answer other questions via email. Everyone, thank you for uh, coming to our webinar, and we really have a great time. We practice a lot, too, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Yanni. I just want to thank yourself and uh, Mark and Tammy and the other team members that were involved and uh, the other participants, and just want to remind uh, the participants that the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, itself uh, plus the recording are, are will be available will be, and that'll be made available to you uh, at a future date and uh, we'll get in touch with you and um, so that's uh, a great opportunity for everybody to have a, a, a valuable takeaway and um, great presentation guys and uh, uh, I wish I had have seen this <laughs> maybe a year ago <laughs> before my latest evaluation project. But uh, there will be more down the road, I hope. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.